street skateboarding exists as it does now because of Rodney Mullen. Rodney Mullen invented all of the modern street skating tricks. I mean, he's the godfather of all that's current. And we watch him and just be like, he's doing stuff that no one has even thought of or could do if they put their mind to it. Rodney Mullen did more for the actual act of skateboarding probably than anyone in the history of the sport. By constantly pushing the realm of what is possible, Rodney Mullen has permanently changed the sport of skateboarding. His legacy began in Gainesville, Florida in 1977. My dad, you know, he was a dentist and he would always say, look man, I just, I just treated a guy last week who had head trauma from going down this hill. There's no way in the world you're going to skateboard, just do something valid like golf or tennis or baseball. One night, I came down kind of crying and uh, could I please just one last chance, you know? So he goes, okay, but only if you wore, wear full pads and the first time you get hurt, you have to stop. So New Year's Day, the surf shop was open and I went there and got my first board. My sister was a surfer, and so she hung out with the whole surf crowd that would surf on the weekends. And then during the week, they would do a lot of slalom and, and set up these ramps. So I would watch those guys and just think, wow, they're cool, you know, this is this independent, there's no coach, there's no nothing. So I, I picked up really, really quick, but of course I'm compulsive, so it's all I can think about. I just focus, you know, and you get good really fast. After just one year of skateboarding, Rodney was sponsored by a nearby shop. Rodney rides for Inland Surf Shop out of Gainesville. He did well in local contests, but was often uneasy around crowds of people. It's hard to emphasize this enough that I was not used to people. How we spoke most of the dog. Here you are on camera right there. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't get to catch your freestyle. What place did you get? I got, I was tired for third with that little really? guy. All right. Skateboarding is something that is so like, I don't know, it talks to me. It's an interaction with something almost, you know, alive. It's because it changes according to you, and, and uh, that's it. It's my friend, yeah. At age 11, Rodney's family moved to a farm outside of Gainesville, Florida. With the closest neighbor two miles away, Rodney lived in near isolation, but this only serves to encourage his obsession. The rural environment began to shape Rodney's skating into a more specialized form, using only flat ground. This later became known as freestyle. It's just the cows in the three-car garage. If that's your only world, you know? So, okay, what can I do with this? So freestyle kind of came from that, but freestyle wasn't really defined at that time. We weren't just freestylers, we were just skateboarders. But we'd enter flatland contests, and that was called freestyle. We also might enter high jump. We might do slalom. We might do downhill. We might do bull riding, too, all in the same day. And, you know, we'd enter every event. As they structured it, it got more and more toward just little tricks. And then the guys who skated pools moved into vert. And the guys who organized the routines moved more into freestyle. And that's when it became delineated. As he concentrated more and more on freestyle, Rodney progressed faster than ever. Soon many established pros began taking notice of him. It was obvious that he had spent a lot of time in his garage, I would guess, or somewhere just practicing many, many hours each day, you could tell. Probably the most crucial time, maybe in my life, was July in 79 to that August in 80. I think it was probably the most creative time for me where I came up with most stuff, like Helipops and Caspers and all these things, they all happened in that year. By the time he entered his first pro contest in 1980, his very technical brand of skating had already left most of the dance and gymnastic oriented freestylers far behind. So I go out there and I'm, I'm looking at everyone and because I hadn't seen anyone and they didn't seem very good. And then I look at Steve and yeah, he's gnarly. So it was between us. I think I won because I got little kid points. His upset victory at the Oasis contest over legendary pro Steve Rocco was more proof to the skateboarding world that Rodney was a force to be reckoned with. The precision and consistency he did things is just unparalleled. It's hard to get mad at something like that. 
He was going to take it to a level that, you know, I couldn't take it to. Skating was just his life. It's all he wanted to do. But just as it was taking off, Rodney's career almost ended because of an odd promise he'd made with his father. In order to be allowed to skate in the Oasis contest, he would have to give up skateboarding when he returned home. And what had happened, I had won and then I came home and I was packing away all my stuff to treasure for the rest of my life, thinking that was it. And, uh, and then the magazines called and the companies are calling and then my dad was like, well look, I guess they're putting money into you and, and so I have no choice, but just know that this is very temporary. And uh, that has echoed in my ears more than anything, anything. That this is very temporary, take it, it's your last chance. Rodney's sort of like a mule. The harder you pull him, the more he digs his heels in. And his dad was always trying to pull him away from skateboarding, which means Rodney clung to it even more. After gaining recognition for his victory at the Oasis contest, Rodney turned pro for Paul Peralta. He was made famous by Paul's breakthrough videos, but still spent much of his time in obscurity, skating alone in his family's garage. All he wanted to do was figure out how to do new things with the skateboard and new tricks. And he didn't care if anyone else was doing it, if anyone else thought it was cool. He just wanted to see what was possible. Although too technical for most, Rodney's innovations began to influence pros who were also pushing the limits of skateboarding. I learned finger flip layers on Burr because I was inspired by Rodney doing it. And I wanted to take some of these things that he was doing and try to learn them in the air, you know, in the pools. That was the first one I did that was directly linked to freestyle. One of Rodney's simpler innovations that completely revolutionized skateboarding was the flat ground ollie. Even on vert, when ollies were first invented, Alan Gelfin didn't really hit his tail, he just kind of scooped it. And so when we would try to mimic that on the street, we would just do it without hitting our tail and barely get anywhere, and Rodney figured out how to snap it and pop it up. I'm sure that he was the first one who ever did a flat ollie that was over like six inches. If that's all he ever did, he would still have to be at, you know, top of the list as far as who's important in skateboarding. But his list of tricks doesn't stop there, you know? 360 flip, kick flip, heel flip, it's all Rodney Mullen tricks. It's, it's crazy because I never knew. I thought Jason Lee invented the 360 flip, you know? But I didn't know to watch a video 10 years before that and see the first one. I've come to learn it, you know, a couple of years ago that Rodney Mullen invented every trick that I know how to do. He was just pushing himself physically and mentally and opening new doors. From the very beginning of his career, Rodney's progression began to put him in a class of his own. He just started overtaking everyone at such a high speed that no one could ever catch him. He was the first skater that I'd ever come across that was committed to his craft, dedicated to it, believed in practicing, believed in going out and getting better. The, the thing that's amazing is just the fact that he wouldn't be just holding back and doing just basic tricks to win the contest. He'd be doing stuff that no one had ever seen before and, and doing it consistently. By the late 80s, Rodney had gained popularity with a more mainstream audience. He was the star of parades, international tours, and even appearances on television. Yeah. Remember in 86, was when it was really dawning on me that skateboarding was big. And then I go on tour, and everyone, there were so many people. And I'm just like this pet on parade. That was the weirdest thing about skateboarding, not so much being a star, but just being surrounded by so many people that were looking at you. And tonight he's here on our stage to demonstrate some of his truly incredible skateboarding skills. So please welcome skateboarder extraordinaire Rodney Mullen. Despite all of his success, Rodney's father still insisted that skateboarding was not a legitimate career. Taking this into consideration, Rodney began to contemplate retirement. By then I was in college and I was doing so much for swatch watches and they were flying me all over the world. That's how I was getting most of the money that I had. No one bought freestyle boards. And I remember thinking, wow, this is it. Grow up. And Steve calls me. He was like, Rodney, look, this is it. I started this business. Steve Rocco was the starting World Industries and had persuaded Rodney not only to stay in skateboarding, but also invest in this new company. To me, a business partner was anybody that, you know, just had excess cash, gullibility, and uh, absenteeism. Rodney had all of those, and uh, he bought out John Lucero for $6,000 and became a partner. As Rodney was investing in another skateboard company, 
he was forced to quit Paul Peralta and ride for World Industries. By this time, freestyle was losing popularity. Consequently, Rodney's new teammates tried to make him adapt his skills to street skating. No, I, I never really liked freestyle. But the shit Rodney was doing, it was like kind of beyond freestyle. A lot of it, a lot of it, you could like use it on the street and stuff. He was doing like a lot of ollie stuff and 360 flips and stuff like that. Rodney, no, don't do it. Here. Uh, freestyle just looks like it's like a a ballerina type thing, you know? Like it seems like it's more the feminine style of skating. So I think that's why it died. Entitles the bear to focus. It feels so weird. It's so big. I feel kind of manly, though. I mean, <laughs> the freestyle had gone out of fashion. Rodney wasn't ready to give up. What are you asking me? You're asking me to give up everything that I've done and do this. I'm not selling out. So here I am with the ultra refined ballerina stuff, and that was fine. And, and so I just kept doing it and doing it and doing it until there was no more. And I'm left alone. I figured that was it for me in my public life and skating. By 1990, Rodney's board was discontinued as freestyle died completely. His responsibilities as a company owner forced him to drop out of college. Although he still skated by himself after work, his career had taken an unexpected turn. And I went through this horrible period of being a company guy, which I never wanted to be, and being like a team manager guy, which I never wanted to be. After I got on, I first went to actually went to the factory. And he's like, you know, the one who's walking around the warehouse and getting my boards and stuff. I'm tripping out like, man, this guy's a team manager. Like, this is Rodney Mullen. Rodney's formal upbringing had done little to prepare him for managing a team of unpredictable kids. We're just trying to survive day to day, and things keep happening. And it is Pandora's box. When you start asking these pros to be themselves and let it out, you know, you're gonna get it. Uh, we were hell. All of us, all those kids that were under issues and blind, and we put Rodney like through it. Seriously, I've never seen anybody look, you know, more stressed out than that. Like, just turn, totally turn pale. Like, look like he wants to faint, you know. And he's got to take care of these little monster kids, and he did a good job, you know. Nobody died. And Cut off from his dreams of skateboarding in school, Rodney was surrounded by people whom he couldn't relate with. Rodney's just an outsider in life. I mean, there's not too many people that can relate to him or that he can even relate with. You tend to be an outcast when you can't find any peers. Just as Rodney was feeling, he no longer had a place in skateboarding. A new company was formed called Plan B. Headed by Mike Ternaski, Plan B wanted to add Rodney's talent and ability to their already incredible team. Once again, an effort was made to get Rodney to street skate. We've been trying to get Rodney to do stuff in the street. I tried, Stacy tried, and we failed. And uh, Mike T came along and goes, man, I, I can do it. And I just was like looking at him, yeah, right. You know, you know, we're never going to get him to do that kind of stuff. I know Mike had a lot to do with pushing Rodney in a direction to want to progress. And it's like, Mike, if he was like gonna say, hey Rodney, do this, he knew that inside of you, you wanted to do it. So what happened with Mike and Rodney was that he saw something in Rodney, and he made a couple comments, and I think he saw like, holy shit, he could really do this if he committed to it.
1994, Mike Ternaski was tragically killed in a car accident. He was such a great person. He lift you so high, and that's why Plan B was what it was. And it was clear once Mike was gone, it just was never the same. Without Ternaski's direction and leadership, Plan B began slowly dissolving over the next four years. In 1997, Rodney started his own company called A-Team. He also came up with an idea involving friend and world teammate, Daywon Song. Rodney vs. Daywon. The way it came about too is it was not planned whatsoever. Rodney had a part ready and he wanted to do something with it. And then I had a part and we were like, you know what? Instead of waiting, let's just make a video together. I like to do it. What do we do? Well, it could be Rodney Daywon friends. But what about Rodney vs. Daywon? Between us, we weren't against each other, but at the same time, we were still competing in a sense, like, the weekend would pass, and I'd be like, Rodney, what do you, you film? And so we keep going because we still have this, hey, what'd you get this weekend? No, what'd you get this weekend? All right, you know, how many tricks you got? 32? Okay, I got 30. After that first video, kids really believe it. Kids were like, oh yeah, I think Rodney's better. Oh no, they weren't killed it, you know? That's when they started getting like, hey, dude, these kids took it serious. They so were like, you wanna do it again? Sure, round two. And then I was like, holy moly, what am I gonna do? I was like an idiot. You did what over the weekend, day one? Oh my God, I'm dead, my career's over. I can't mess with a lot of stuff Rodney does. I mean, that's the truth. But we do such different tricks that it bounces off each other, you know what I mean? Like, we fed off each other. His skating impact at vert skating, impact at street skating, and, and he himself was just a, a skateboarder, the most progressive skateboarder probably ever. He invented everything. He started it all, even though it was on a small square board. Ronnie Moan invented all of the modern street skating tricks. I mean, he's the godfather of all that's current. Markenthal's made up the dark slide, jumping on the rail, you know, the caveman way, but Rodney was the first one to like, that I've seen, like Ollie half flip to a dark slide and pull it, and he's done like, who knows how many variations of it. Everybody has their own way of understanding skateboarding, and Rodney breaks down tricks into little itty bitty components and builds them up until he can pull it off. He could explain it to you and break it down to like the weight distribution for your foot. Like, do you lean a little bit on the outside of your heel? Do you lean on the ball of your foot? The way the truck sits on a block, just from like being around him and stuff, like I have a new understanding of the mechanics of skateboarding in a way, like down to like the way a truck sits on a block. When I'm filming a hard trick that's challenging for me, then there are certain motions that you have to do, right? Manual tricks are hard and they're testy. It knows really an flip, knows really over the gap, for instance. So you have these motions that you know in your head. I know what a flip feels like. But when you're actually, what makes the trick for you is finally you 
pack all that stuff for granted and you forget about it, and you're focusing only on, or I am at least, you're focusing on only one aspect of where my eye is and my back shoulder is uh, at the time I see the edge of the table. And then everything else is taken for granted and runs autopilot. But as long as I can control that one and get a good nose wheelie from the start, I've got it. And that's how it works for me. Stack, 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 stack. Bracket and put like a tablecloth over it and focus on this last little bit and that's what does it. This is something a lot of people, I mean, just don't even know or don't even want to admit, but basically Rodney invented today's modern board shape, period. And it all started with the Mike Vallely Animal Farm board. And it went from there and Rodney basically took that board and started rounding the tail and then rounding the nose so you could ollie better. You know, before you knew it, you got a big long freestyle board. I rode the sample. It, it, was just it worked out. Right on. on. Rodney's product designs now are becoming as revolutionary as his skating. And that's just exactly what the slider is supposed to look like. Light years ahead of everything else. And Rodney's is driven by his ability to see what's next. If he can see what's on the horizon for a trick or an idea, he'll just start going after it. Seriously, I wouldn't be surprised if Rodney's a pro for another 10 years. I, it, wouldn't, I, it wouldn't shock me. It almost shocked me if he wasn't. He was supposed to retire in 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99. He's not retiring anywhere. He's just going to keep filming video parts and keep pushing his limits. And even when you think you've seen it all, you know, like he definitely will step it up again and surprise you. I still am most comfortable with skating. I just go out under a street light somewhere and I, I do this stuff and I get peace. I can think. And that skateboarding to me, you know, is creating something. That's cool, you know? I mean, who knows what really drives someone to progress? It could be fear. 
or competition or being basically tormented by ideas. That's just gonna force you to progress, you know, or you go crazy. Every time he goes out and skates, he sees something else out there, he'll just start going after it. He just loves what he's doing. dabble in freestyle. I mean, I learned finger flip airs because, oh sorry, it was inevitable. <clears throat> Where'd that go? Oh, oh, I don't need it. You might still hear it though. It's the only way it's gonna bend the segment. Dude, I just made like 300 bucks, huh? He's very, very big now, very important. Every now and then he'll come here with an entourage of about 16 or 17 people. They'll all tell him how great he is. I wait in line, say hi, skate with him a little bit. But yeah, it's cool. We're still, he's still, every now and then will look at me and I, I appreciate that. So yeah, it's great. Blatant product endorsement, can't go wrong. That's a cool $10. Thing that no one else is really trying to do, which is probably super important. I don't think no one has that much time or patience. Oh, Negro does it. Yeah, it was a pretty bad little thing we did there. Well, yeah, let's go ahead. Right no, that's cool. Actually, let me get it real quick. Oh. Sorry. Man, I'm sorry. Hello? Um, I just almost broke somebody's camera. Yeah, let me call you back, okay? Sorry.